Jerry Springer died. What a week. First Tucker Carlson and now Springer. It's been brutal for people who should have never been born in the first place. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. They say Jerry Springer transformed television the same way a shark in a jacuzzi transforms water. Until Jerry Springer, it actually meant something to be on television. Because of Jerry Springer, game shows and soap operas were soon considered too highbrow for daytime television. And so local stations decided the lowest common denominator needed to be lowered and more common. Why hire writers or actors when 300 pounds squeezed into a halter top will go on TV to accuse a giant tattoo wearing a trucker cap of infidelity? Throw a few chairs, you have drama and pathos. Who needs Aaron Sorkin? At the height of his popularity, the Jerry Springer show allowed middle America to watch these factory rejects and feel good about themselves. But soon our entire culture followed Jerry Springer into the gutter and then burrowed even deeper below the gutter so that now old reruns of the Jerry Springer show seem almost aspirational. Jerry Springer accelerated the end of our civilization. The only difference between his show and January 6 is Jerry Springer never made it to C-SPAN. I'm sure Jerry Springer, just like Maury Povic, Povich, Povic, Povich, I'm sure they both figured if I didn't host these shows, someone else will. Yeah, but you did. You decided to host these types of shows. Jerry Springer was the mayor of Cincinnati. He had political ambitions. Maury Povich is the son of a famous journalist and had a career in journalism before he turned to sleaze. Both these men, Jerry Springer and Maury Povich, they knew better, but they did it anyway. They did it anyway, even though they both knew better. They had choices. They chose this life. Jerry Springer found the ugliest, the stupidest, the vilest people in America and put them out in front of millions. Roger Ailes was starting Fox News, watched Springer and thought, why not give these idiots their own shows? And then Trump ran for president and they all got their own party. Like Tucker Carlson, Jerry Springer was no great intellect. Neither man invented cashing in on our basest instincts. They were just willing to venture where everyone else with a modicum of human decency refused to go. It doesn't take a genius to shove a TV camera into the bowels of Western civilization and keep shoving until you eventually strike gold. That's what Tucker Carlson, Maury Povich, and Jerry Springer did. Just when we all thought television had explored every nook and cranny of America's lower intestine, they found a marble-sized pouch of human excrement. And then Andy Cohen from Bravo thought, what if we infect these pouches of human excrement, shove a GoPro up there, and videotape the torn intestinal walls, the blood and the pus, and call it Real Housewives.
You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. Professor Harvey J.K. joins us from Wisconsin. He is the author of FDR on Democracy. We're going to be talking about Joe Biden. But first, you're working with Marion Williamson, who yeah. is yeah, challenging Joe it, Biden. OK, so let me make it clear. So I worked with Nina Turner, all you know, so much of her campaign. I was advising her. She was embracing the Economic Bill of Rights. And I still maintain a daily contact and relationship with with Nina. OK, I don't get paid for any of this stuff. This is strictly on the House. <laughs> OK. And similarly, Marianne, a year ago around now, got in touch with me. We got to talking a lot. And, you know, I, I'm not Actually, if you'd asked me a year ago what I knew about Marianne Williamson, I actually would not have had a lot to say. I honestly didn't know. And I think I mentioned this on many a show we did during last year, that when she asked me to come on, I figured, well, I better find out who this is in a a more effective way than Googling it. So I actually picked up her book, A A A Politics of Love. Believe me, I don't think I've ever bought a book with the title Love in it since Eric Fromm's book in the 60s, when I was a teenager, what was I called? The Art of Loving or Art of whatever it was, Art right. of Love, whatever. Unless that was a porn book that from back in those right. days. But you got the idea, okay? Mm-hmm. So anyway, but I read it and, and I actually, it's going to sound funny, but I actually, and I generally do read presidential campaign books by the major figures. But I hadn't read that one because um, in my mind at that point in 2020, it wasn't really on my radar. So I read it and I actually was fairly impressed by a certain kind of historical sensibility she brought to all of it. And I didn't find myself getting caught up in any kind of spiritual rhetoric. And so we became friends and I made it clear that her spiritual career is not really much interest to me, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started just advising her about, you know, the campaign possibilities about FDR, about Tom. I mean, a whole bunch of historical things that might well feed into her campaign and her speech making and things like that. So we've become pretty good friends. And um, yeah, and I can tell you that sometime in the next several weeks, I think it is, she'll be giving a major policy and vision kind of speech, pretty much attached to the Economic Bill of Rights uh, idea. Right. So it's, it's, it's definitely, it's been really a pleasure to, to work with her. Is she going to debate Biden? Are there going to be debates? Well, that's a that's Trump a really says, good question. Trump says he doesn't want to debate. Now, are we going to go back to the way it was before <laughs> Carter and Ford? wasn't Wasn't there a respite after Nixon Kennedy where they stopped that's debating? A good, that's a good question. I you know I, I don't remember those. Um, Kennedy and and Carter did not debate. No, no. Kennedy and Nixon debated, and then everybody said never again. And then I think Gerald Ford debated Carter. Oh, yeah. Was... Kennedy and Nixon debated. Right. That's right. right. And Johnson did not debate no. Goldwater, I guess. Right. And yeah. Nixon wouldn't so, debate Humphrey. Yeah. And uh, uh, Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it. I mean, can Biden debate Nixon. anymore? Well, that, that you know, I don't honestly, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I mean, let's put it this way. If Bernie had wanted to. Or no, if, if Bernie had allowed himself to, that's a better way of putting it, really debate Biden in 2020. Right. I think he would have really taken Biden apart. I mean, every time he got close to the point of truly debating him, he kind of bit his tongue, Bernie. Well, they, he never got a chance. The, the, the COVID, by the time they had those debates on CNN, they had to do it in a private studio and Biden already had the nomination locked up in the run. Well, no, I don't I, no, um I don't think it had quite reached quite reached. The, the point is, I think at that at that moment, Biden could literally have deflated. Bernie could have deflated Biden on that stage. Uh, I do believe now that. But that's just it. I don't I mean, you have to understand. And I've said this to a lot of people lately that Bernie was clearly worried about fascism right. of a Nazi-like sort. Right. Okay. And as a consequence, he weighed his own career against the threat 
of that possibility. And he made his choice. And I fully appreciated that. I I agree with you. Okay. Now, here's the other thing, however. I read Bernie's new book, the one he did in in conjunction with my friend um, John Nichols. And if you read that book, in the first one third of the book, you'd swear that Bernie has to be a sadomasochist, that he that he could still hold on to a friendship with Biden and line up that closely and, and be so closely affiliated with him. It's astounding because he's he's very clear and clearly was angry about how the Democrats maneuvered, manipulated and made Biden the candidate by having everyone else who was ahead of Biden by you know, mm-hmm. in any estimation, have them drop out. Right. And you ask yourself, well, this is a book. What's the title like, you, you know, why you should be angry about capitalism or something? Well, frankly, it's why you should be angry about the Democratic Party is right. not the book, because everything else in the book, we already heard from Bernie. There was nothing fresh about that. And, and I'll also, as a sidebar to that, say that that Bernie's history is not that good. In the in what he says in the book about a few things. What do you mean? He makes that he, he brings up the Economic Bill of Rights of FDR, and he basically says that when 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 FDR pronounced the Economic Bill of Rights in 1944, it was wartime, and so it didn't get much attention. Well, that's bullshit. It got a lot of attention. The AFL, the CIO, the national there was a National Civic Action Group. In other words, it got major attention, and he re- returned to it in the fall of that year. And they rallied tremendously. Hell, I could show you. I even ha- well, I, I have a book. Yeah, here. This is a volume people can see. Oops. Okay. The first round. This is how, the story of the CIO Political Action Committee. These are the copies of all the pamphlets and broadsides that the CIO was distributing around the country in 1944 in support of the Economic Bill of Rights and the re-election of FDR and they're brilliant pamphlets, very very popular kinds of writing. So and and so for him to just for him to say, well, it's great the Economic Bill of Rights, but you know it didn't get much attention. It's just it's wrong, absolutely, it's just wrong. And then the other and it fails not only because it's historically wrong, it also fails because the most interesting thing that occurred at that time is that FDR pronounced the Economic Bill of Rights. Because they had done polling in 1943, asking Americans, what do you want after the war? And I think I've told you before, anywhere from 80 plus percent of Americans wanted national health care, education, is public education, you know, free public education as far as they could go. Um, I mean, all of the things that would be wrapped up into what he called his Economic Bill of Rights idea. So when he went before the American people and Congress in January of 1944 to call or project an economic bill of rights project. He didn't do it because he had this great idea, which he, by the way, had been carrying around for quite some time. It's because he was confident that even if Congress would not go there, the vast majority of American people were with him when he said that. Right. And so, I mean, and Bernie, what Bernie could well have said is, just like today, the majority of Americans want national health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are those who stand in the way. And it's not only Republicans, it's a great number of Democrats. And by the way, in that vein, I mean, if we think about what's happened to the Democratic Party, I mean, it it gets worse every month that passes or, you know, so once upon a time, we all thought the squad was going to at least make a difference. Not only have they not made a tremendous difference, but they they fail themselves. They don't even have to stand up and say, screw you, Biden. All they would have had to do is rally around, you know, a dozen of them together, if there are that many, and projected a vision, a progressive vision, and said, this is the vision we have for the Democratic Party and the nation. Okay, so at least it would sustain some understanding on the part of the American people that there are Democrats on the left who believe in that democracy is not a status quo operation. Bernie announced immediately after Joe announced that he would not challenge, that he he endorsed Joe Biden immediately this week. In in, uh, 1980. And he added and he added that he didn't think any any major progressives should challenge Biden either. Now, there's some some people said, well, did he actually say that or is that just what the AP News reported? 
But that just, that's crazy. That's just bull. Where's Bernie? I mean, Bernie is going to tell other progressives don't challenge Biden. I mean, come on. I mean, it's one thing for him to endorse. Another, it's nothing to tell him not to, not to, you know, to Let me put him. you in the hot seat for a second. Professor okay. Harvey J.K., author of FDR on Democracy. We go back a while now. You and I, you bet. Yeah, you bet. And we watched the Democratic debates and talked about them. And we were both avid Bernie supporters. You bet. And dis Absolutely. disgusted by Joe Biden. But when the general came around, both you and I said, we're going to hold our noses. Right. And vote for Joe Biden because I still have my statement over my right here nearby. What? Right. And we were both accused of cowardice and uh, I'm just not brave enough. I don't have enough faith uh, in the American people and our government uh, for it not to just to assume that we're not going to take a fascist turn like many other countries in South America have done. It's built. Yeah, into well, I, I can. OK, let me just sidebar before you get to the key question. Let me make it clear. I have in writing, I said in 2000 and when did he take 2007? Was it 2016? Like in 2017, I said it isn't just Trump. We've seen 40 at that point. It was 40 years. Now I can say it's, you know, well, the more years of what remember the old term creeping socialism that goes back to the days of Reagan and Goldwater and all that kind of stuff. Well, we've seen creeping authoritarianism ever since the late 1970s. And, 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 and we've seen it all the more. I mean, we are now 45 to 50 years into the, an effort on a grand scale by, by, I can't even call them conservatives by reactionaries who've taken over the Republican party all the more effectively to literally smash, crush, and deny democratic rights to vast numbers of Americans, or in any case, democracy as a as the rule of, of law in this country. So there was no little doubt in my mind that a Trump victory, Trump in himself was just a, you know, he's he's a POS as far as things go. But it's not Trump. He he's he he has this vast following and the Republican Party. Look, DeSantis is in many ways more evil than Trump, if we're going to talk good and evil. Right. But Trump is a is a great vehicle for all of the ugliest, most fascistic forces imaginable. So I don't not, I don't think of me as a coward. I think of me as a, as, as a small D Democrat. And, and anyone who would have called me a coward, screw them. And a large P pragmatist. So a quick history lesson and or a question about history and then. A question about you. Yeah. Uh, Reagan. If Reagan no. didn't get elected, if Jimmy Carter was reelected, I suspect you believe that we would have been on the same trajectory with Jimmy Carter as we would with Ronald Reagan. Well, I mean, it's hard to say quite the same trajectory because it would be interesting because it's all these little things about history that get, get make it complex. For example, there is little doubt in my mind that Carter paved the way to Reagan. Carter's policies from 78 to 80 really were like, and when people say paved the way, yeah, I have no doubt. They laid the groundwork, they paved over it and brought in Volcker, who was the, you know, the guy who made all the things happen that Reagan wanted to happen. Deregulation. Deregulation, I'm a, a decidedly deregulation, and also smash the working class. I mean, they were taking already taking a beating. Now, well, let's just smash them anyhow. You know, we had the Reagan recession, 81, 82. Th that recession is a consequence of the Volcker policies. Okay, To bring so, down um, inflation. The idea was we need to bring down, we had double digit inflation. It was class war on the working class. That's, you know, it's, they say that to fight inflation, but it's class war on the working class. That's exactly what they did. And they, and he smashed the, the Patco strike. But the, the irony is that Patco had endorsed Reagan for president because they could, didn't feel they'd get any justice from Jimmy Carter. And of course, they weren't getting any justice from Ronald Reagan and he fires them all, okay? Right. And, and, and by the way, the union busting had already been taking place throughout the 70s, as, we, as was once said, the fastest growing enterprise in America in the 70s was union busting law firms. But now, basically, you had the president of the United States breaking the back of a public employee's union and you, you can, you know, you see the future at that moment. Okay, but 
is it fair to say that the Democrats in 1980, when Jimmy Carter was running yeah. for re-election, was owned and operated by unions? They were being abandoned and weakened. It, is it fair to say that the Kennedy wing, the Tip O'Neill wing yeah. of the Democratic Party in 1980, had Jimmy Carter been reelected, would not have allowed Jimmy Carter to usher in Reaganomics? That's a fair statement, right? We wouldn't have seen the kind of you, catering to Wall Street. You, you would not have seen the 80s would, would have would might well have looked different. But understand that Reaganomics was already underway by way of Jimmy Carter and Volcker. But at, at that kind of tax cuts for the, the catering to the wealthy, the promotion of inequality. Well, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, and I don't think we would have seen it on the gross scale we did. Right. But Carter's speeches in 1978 called for not only, you know, it called for austerity. He wanted to liberate capital. I could go in and find you the exact words. He wanted to liberate capital. So, you know, I mean, what more does one have to say about it than that? Right. But, but don't forget, Reagan's victory really did, if you like, take what Carter began and magnify it. And, you know, really, it sort of brought, sorry, not just magnify it, literally enforce it for, for the next eight years. And let's not forget, Carter, if he had won, would not could not run again in 84. But if he had screwed up again as much as he was screwing up before, you can bet that that well, Reagan would not have run in 84. Then he would have been too, too old. old. But Mondale okay. was the vice president and he was more of a liberal than Carter was. Wasn't yeah. He? But don't forget as well. Remember what Mondale did in the debates in the debates. What did he say? He said. I'll raise your He's taxes. He's not going to tell you, but we're going to raise your taxes. Well, what kind of effing idiot says that's the way we're going to address things by raising your taxes? I like that. I like. I, that. Look, I don't oppose raising taxes if you're going to rate. Okay, if you're going if you can smash the billionaires, but it's not exactly the way to go. Okay, I mean, it's and that's not what the American people wanted. The poll. Everybody ignores the polls of the '70s into the '80s. Americans may well have been shaken by the events of the 70s, but they still had the same, they made the same commitments in polling in the 70s and 80s as they had made in the 60s. I mean, I, I've got the material somewhere over here as well. They wanted, Americans wanted social democracy. Nobody wants to talk about that term, but they wanted social democracy. Right. And it, we lacked leadership. I, I maintain. Yes, we did. You're right. We, we lacked leadership. I remember my father and I watching Reagan giving a speech and he was president. And my father said, I, I loathe this man to the core of my very being. I believe my father spoke just like that. And he's incredibly bad for this country, but he's doing something. He says, this reminds me of when, you know, Roosevelt, uh, he said, this is dangerous because it feels good to see a president <laughs> doing something. It's not good, but that, it's- that undeniable. You know what? That, that's an interesting observation. A very, very, very interesting and observation. And it's scary. Uh, yeah, it really is, which is why, yes, it is, which is why we should not underestimate the capacity for, look, I once predicted neither Trump nor Biden, you will recall, I swore Biden, neither Biden nor Trump was gonna be the candidates in 2024. I think I'm wrong. I yeah. think I'm wrong. I don't want Biden. I don't want Trump. But DeSantis, as I, I didn't think DeSantis could go. I didn't think he could ever rise to the to the level that He's, Trump. Has DeSantis, DeSantis. DeSantis. But let me get to my question about Mary. Oh, sorry that we haven't reached. Well, no, okay. it's fascinating. Let me. I want to ask you about Marion Williamson and your work with Marion Williamson. Yeah. Is it fair to say that Teddy Kennedy? I I know where you're going to go. Where am I going? Did Teddy Kennedy cost Carter the presidency? Right. Now, first off, was Teddy Kennedy, would he have been a better president than Jimmy Carter? If he stayed sober, I guess so. Wasn't Teddy Kennedy a great man? Despite Teddy Kennedy was a, Teddy Kennedy believed in health care. That, that's important. OK, that, and look, he was against the war. And he was against both wars in Iraq. Yeah. And he, and yeah. he was for uh the, the dreamers and the immigrants and open borders. 
and the, the working people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I may be going out on a limb when I say this, but of the three Kennedy brothers, Joseph, of course, was killed during World War II. Right. Okay, Joseph, Joe Jr. But of the three Kennedy brothers, the one who was probably the most liberal left of the three- And underrated. Was Teddy Kennedy. And underrated. If you look at his positions and what he yeah. pushed for. Yeah. So right. when he ran again, when he challenged Carter in 1980, yeah. He and Tip O'Neill were appalled by Jimmy Carter because he because Carter was abandoning the the left and the liberals. Oh, hey, I, and let's let every let's remind everyone three there, there were forces that put Jimmy Carter into office. OK, Watergate aside for the moment. OK. And one of them was the labor movement. Another was the environmental movement. And the third was Nader's consumer movement. And he turned his back on all three in 78. OK, so Kennedy figured, hell, this guy deserves to be primaried. Right. And on top of that, on top of that, people then said, oh, you're going to cost, you know, the, the Democrats. But and I think you're going to ask me, did he cost Carter the election? Did he cost? And that was no. the question. No. no, no, he did not. Voters did not. The Democratic voter did not they didn't believe in carter and if you look millions stayed home rather than go show up to vote for reagan they in other words there's no doubt reagan won but if you look at at who stayed home they stayed home they just would not they had little desire to vote for carter but is it but a but it's what, the old line was it was it truman if you've got what is it if you don't have you know i can never paraphrase this one well but it had to do with you know, if you're if you're given a choice of two Republicans, you're going to vote for the real one or the phony one. Right. In other words, if you don't have the choice of a Democrat and Carter, what did he offer? What did Carter offer? More of the same. I don't remember anything that he offered. But again, I never voted for Carter. I so, didn't vote for him in 76 and I didn't vote for him in 80. So the conventional wisdom is that Reagan cost Gerald Ford the election in 1976 by he primaried a sitting president, Gerald Ford. Yeah, Reagan right. did. He almost won. He, I think, at one point in the convention, they were yes, in seventy six. Right. They were going to do a co presidency. Between, well, uh, yeah, like a president vice president thing. But right. they were going to be equal. Gerald Ford and Reagan were going to be equal. Yeah, I don't know about the word equal. I, I don't know if I've ever run across the term equal. I think it was the idea that they were going to create this kind of you know coalition. So the, um, the conventional wisdom is Reagan's challenge in 76 weakened Ford enough for Carter to win. Uh, well, again, I can't again, I, I'm, I'm a little under, I lived in Louisiana at the time. I I I saw little reason to vote in 76. And, and I confess I did not vote. I didn't see much difference really between Carter and Ford, which I know is stupid. But right. I was young and I was a Marxist. And, and you were, uh, you were, you had, you were. Had and no I was in a state that was definitely going to go Carter. There you was had, nothing to, I had no reason to you show were, up. You had no shoes right. and you were living. I even there. remember, I have vaguely recall reading an op-ed, maybe in the New York Times by a New York rabbi saying, there's, vel there's little moral difference between Ford and Carter. And I thought, okay, that's the final thing. I don't need this. That's my vague recollection. So... Kennedy, will Mar so Marianne will not. Well, let, let me ask you. Well, hang okay. on. So Bernie, don't you think Bernie fears that if he makes a run for it, he'll do what Reagan and uh, Ted Kennedy did to the, the incumbents and facilitate their loss or contribute to their loss? Because I do think <laughs> if Biden has to defend his uh, record uh, to to Bernie, uh, you know, if Bernie's going to run a full throated campaign against the incumbent, he's going to do a lot of work that the Republicans are incapable of doing. Yeah, look, I, I, I will tell you that I, I had said to Marianne that if Bernie enters, I know where I'm going. Right. OK, it became. But then I was told by some insiders, Bernie was not going to run which made me all the more all the more disposed to work with with Mary. So but the reason is. So, I again, I can't tell you who said this. A, a, a major progressive journalist said to me, 
Marianne, can, even if Marianne can't win at this moment, I mean, it's not to say, she, you know, every, who the hell knows what could happen, but she could play a major role in trying to drag Biden to the left. If she garners enough delegates to go to the convention, the Democratic Party would have to presumably would have to respond if they let her get that far. OK. Right. And I remember saying to Marianne before that before before, you know, I, I you know, worked with her. We were already friends. I said to her, Americans need to hear the things I know you're going to say. If you look at what she's saying, it's it is very much what Bernie was saying. But I also want to say Mary has a has a finer sense of American history than Bernie does. It's I, I believe that. Right. From conversations and my work with her. And so I, I really do believe that Marianne has an important role to play in American public life. And I think that and I and right now, let me go back to something you said. It is very hard to defend this administration's record. This goes and I can tell you where it began. If it began when Bernie was basically hamstrung and unable to get a $15 minimum, minimum, minimum wage at the federal level. And two Delaware senators joined the eight Democrats who blocked it. Two Delaware senators who presumably could not have had political careers if Biden had enabled them to have political careers. So you're going to tell me Biden couldn't have made a difference? Let's start at that level. Now let's come to more recent times. Joe Biden clearly, clearly either didn't care enough to talk to these to the railway work the railway bosses or he talked to them and basically said don't worry as he's told corporate bosses before nothing will change mm -hmm. when he when he could have said you know what it's only 6 months or 5 months or 4 months to christmas i'm going to become a hero and the way i'm going to become a hero is i'm going to sign an executive order nationalizing the railways. And while I've nationalized it, I'm going to give sick days to the workers and their unions, and I'm going to raise their wages, and I'm going to make sure that we have Christmas. And I'm good, and people will then promote me as the savior of Christmas. Right. And what did, he did nothing. And then he waited and waited and waited, and then he asked Congress to literally put, you know, smash the railway workers at the left. By the way, railway workers didn't even want to go on strike. Nobody wants to go on strike. Right. That's like you're up against the wall. And then, of course, AOC and the crew just all fell in line and voted again. Can you imagine? It is fucking. Sorry, I don't know what you're allowed to use nowadays, given the various. They're not. I understand the frustration with the squad. They, their, their job is not to fall in line. Their job is to fight. We have some questions. Rodrigo. Can Professor Kay talk about the process of creeping fascism and how we don't have to wait until the death camps open to have 1930s fascism? Well, we do have concentration camps. We, you know, Core Civic and ICE, we are putting asylum seekers in for profit concentration camps and feeding them concentration camp food, locking them in solitary. Uh, they're not death camps, although they're suicides, but these are, by definition, concentration camps. Yeah, I mean, well, you're talking now at the, at the end of, of these 45 years. I'll go back 45 years and tell you to begin with. Look, labor unions were under siege in the 70s. Voting rights were under siege the day after, the day after Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. Immediately. The, the war on voting rights was renewed, okay? And women's rights, I mean, Roe v. Wade, okay, didn't necessarily, you know, prevent the emergence in the 70s of a vast, what was once called the moral majority, the Christian right, and so on. All of these things were then and there in the 70s. Where were the Democrats when they really had control of Congress? Okay, what did they do? What did they do to secure a woman's right to choose? What did they do to to turn a, to turn around the corporate bosses who were trying to smash labor unions? What did they do to all the more secure voting rights? Over and over again. Look, now the Democrats say, "You've got." By the way, I mean, push comes to shove, yeah, I'll vote for Democrats in the end because 
the alternative is that starkly ugly, right? Okay, and we can see it in the states. All you got to do is watch what's happening in the states. Watch what's happening in Wisconsin. Look around. Watch what's happening around the. But here's the thing. Right now, the Democrats are going to run in favor of defending lost rights. This is 45 years later in right. defending lost rights. And, I'm, and I know that I've said this many times to you, okay, back in the late 19th century, Wendell Phillips, and then later at the turn of the century, Henry Demers Lloyd, they said, the only way you can defend the rights your parents have afforded you is to create new rights for your children. Democracy has to be more of a growth enterprise than fucking capitalism. Wow. And in Wisconsin, is there hope? You have a new Supreme Court justice. Well, the weirdest thing is we've got this new Supreme Court justice, but now the Republican legislature can override the vetoes of the governor because they have the supermajority in the legislature. The point is, however, the, the point is, though, with the Supreme Court now in the hands of a more liberal group, we can now perhaps undo the redistricting that the Republicans imposed on the state. We can possibly pursue a lawsuit that would restore workers' rights, both public employees and private sector. I mean, it does afford possibilities. And, it, and it's a reminder that the majority of Wisconsinites will, will vote to the left if they have a left to vote for. And exactly. that Supreme Court justice represented that. Right, right. Anthony writes, does Professor K have any quick thoughts on Father Charles Coughlin? Coughlin or Coughlin? It's Coughlin. Coughlin, right? Coughlin. Yeah, as a media pundit, uh, Coughlin initially supported the New Deal. Remind us or teach us who uh, Father Coughlin was. Yeah, Father Coughlin, Coughlin, Coughlin was a priest who was born Catholic. in Canada, who came across into the United States and and broadcast from, is it Port Royal, Michigan? For, something like that. Somewhere, it's up in Michigan. And in the he did originally support the New Deal, but and he broadcast against bankers, okay, in the early 30s. But he discovered his real voice in the towards the later 30s, where he turned into a fierce anti-Semite and essentially saw, you know, uh, he, he, he became a Nazi Catholic, basically. I mean, that's what it turned into. And even the Catholic Church eventually was even the Catholic Church was willing to, you know, eventually shut him down. But and there were spin-offs of his thing, like they were the the Christian, whatever they were, they called themselves the Christian something or other up in Boston who would attack Jewish elderly folks on the streets. Um, look, we, we had th we had the emergence of this these past several years, you know, and, you know, in a, in a more handsome guise, perhaps, you know, like Tucker Carlson and uh, well, Rush Limbaugh, we suffered for years. OK, Tucker Carlson and others. And, uh, you know, they cultivated a kind of racialism and anti-immigration and you know, give them, a, give, them a, give them another opportunity. They, they might have gone after Jews more publicly, too. They, they don't go away. You can get rid of Tucker Carlson. You can. You yeah, know. they don't go away. As yeah. These po folks do not create. These folks are empowered by the failure of the Democrats to do what needed doing all these years, but which drove a lot of white working people away. They alienated white but, working but, people. But, but, but not, Coughlin, not, not, wait, hold on. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that because they were soft you know, on cultural issues or you know, identity politics. It's that they were so much more interested, perhaps, in identity politics than class politics. And as a consequence, most of the people who turned to the Republican Party and to the, and to the likes of the idiots who are, are their mouthpieces is the fact that they hated the Democrats. They came to hate the Democrats. All right, hang on for one all you second. Gotta do, by the way, all you got to do, all you got to do is come out to the Midwest and um, Marianne Cummings, I'm sure, can say the same thing I can. Go to the smaller towns and rural areas and it's nightmarish. OK, I mean, go even go to where where she's been teaching, Northern Illinois University and the, the city of DeKalb, town of DeKalb. I mean, these places are devastated compared to what they may well have been in the past. And you know, I mean, NAFTA sure as hell didn't help. Um, and the East and West Coast elites often don't realize just what people have gone through these past 40 years. Carter, Reagan, Gore. Clinton. Yep. Okay. Professor yeah. Harvey J.K., author of FDR and Democracy, how do you explain Father Coughlin? Uh, oh, the 1930s. Look, because you had 1930s. Roosevelt, you had Roosevelt being the the. 
quintessential Democrat that we all want. And yet there was a rise of fascism. So how do you explain well, that? There, there was no vacuum. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. The, the FDR in 1936 smashed the opposition. Absolutely smashed the opposition. OK, but it doesn't necessarily mean he was that FDR was the chant, you know, Look, I mean, the 1930s, America was sorely divided by race and religion. Anti-Catholicism. I mean, that was the strange so thing. My it, question yeah. is, hang on for one second. Yeah. Uh, we all say, I say this on the show all the time, that the Democrats create the conditions for fascism by not responding to the needs of the, the, the working class, the soon to be poor and the poor. Well, you have... Roosevelt, we keep yearning for a Roosevelt to come along. Here was someone in the 30s catering to the working people and the soon but to it, be but, poor. Yeah, but, and but there was still the, fascism. There was still. No, 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 no. I, fuck that. You're wrong. I mean, oh, okay. The point is the overwhelming majority of Americans did indeed vote for the Democrats. And the overwhelming majority of Americans wanted social democracy. The polls showed it. But there was Undenized still fascism. Right? There was and the wait, no. Hold on. Wait, wait. The South was still one party regimes. The Democratic Party in the South was one party white supremacist Jim Crow regimes. Right. I mean, I mean, there's only so if you compare the 30s to before the 30s, you can see the degree to which there was a dramatic transformation in American public life. I could show you texts produced by the American army as their training manuals for recruits, which basically wrote off, I mean, you know, basically preached small limited government, said one of the greatest threats to American democracy were the immigrants from Eastern Europe. I mean, boom, 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 boom. You go into the 30s, you start looking at, at what was going on. It was it was different. The, the CCC literally changed the story for millions of young Amer American men as to what it meant to be an American. Similarly, the WPA and so on. If 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 the Democrats over these last 20 years had wanted to counter the emer well, they didn't want to counter the emergence of those conservatives. They were in the, they were paid for bought, they were bought and paid for by the very same capitalists that the Republicans were. The only difference was they were the, the Democrats were capitalism with a charitable face, and the Republicans were, you know, capital capitalists without the charitable face. Right. You know. I mean, is there something else? All they had to do, they could have they could have created a totally different set of political circumstances by creating systems, organizations, um, opportunities, compulsion by bringing together the diverse Americans to work on projects. Uh, should, we should have had a national service system. Yes, drop the draft. National service. And all these kids would have had to come together, whether they liked it or not. They could have had fist fights all they wanted, but they would have had to build things together. Right. Right. Okay. But is there something. Is there an allure to fascism besides poverty and not feeling and feeling not feeling listened to by your government? That That's what we've convinced ourselves, that people turn to fascism when there's no alternative. But is there something to fascism that is more than uh, economic well, there, yeah, I mean, well, Fascism doesn't, doesn't promise goodies. Fascism promises meaning and purpose. Okay? So tell me what it means, right? I'll tell you a little story. Okay? I'm running... I'm, we're over time now. It's we're okay. One minute we, we have a... Prof okay. Okay. It's... it's tell it's, me a story. Uh, it's my our musical friend, right? Yes. Going to come on next. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're behind schedule. I apologize to him right now for okay. running over time. Look, I met last year, about a year ago, with a Demo a member of the Democratic Caucus, who for a while was indeed a co-chair of the progress, sorry, of the Progressive Caucus in Congress, to try explain to him now at least you know it's a guy explain to him what alan and i were try, were developing this economic bill of rights idea and alan I minsky you, progressive democrats of america chairman yes yeah alan, alan minsky and i could see this is i you know you can you can look into someone's eyes and you know if they're listening or just standing there and i had the feeling he was just saying and i just said i said screw this and i said to him i won't say his name i said to him you know what if we walk down main street in any 
significant city. And we ask people, what does it what does the Democratic Party stand for? They couldn't tell you. And if they could tell you, it would have been the opposite of the talking points of the Republicans. They would have said, well, they don't stand for this and they don't stand for that. And I said, as long as the Democratic Party has no story and no vision that can speak across race and ethnicity and and basically do the kinds of things that FDR was trying to do, that for all of his faults and failings, you know, the likes of Kennedy and Johnson and all those guys, as long as you don't have the story, the vision and the program and, and the capacity to mobilize people in pursuit of something, we're stuck. At, we're stuck in the mud. And that that congressman said to me, well, you know, Nancy Pelosi, she tells us we win on our values. Take your values. And I can tell you, I knew at that moment so much for the progressive caucus. Yeah. Democrat. I realize that Democrats uh, the Democratic leadership treats its voters like uh, men treat, treat their first wives. They're ashamed of them. Yeah. And by the way, if I can just say next Friday is my wife's and my 50th wedding anniversary. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yep. A week from today. Is it true that FD, I, I, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, FDR, is it, somebody says, is it true that FDR shut, Father Cochran down and got him off the air. Yeah, they, they, yes, they I basically. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the administration effectively said to the Catholic Church, get him off the air. And th yeah. th this is anonymous attendee saying today, the free speech warriors allegedly on the left would make their living helping Coughlin instead of stopping the public. You froze on me, David. I'm still here. Yeah. OK, now you're moving. OK, th this is an interesting. Let me just, by the way, the city of. There were surveys done early on in the war. And this in Wisconsin, which was the German American state, there was greater support for the war effort than in the city of Boston, I believe. Wow. All right. Professor Harvey JK is the author of many books, including FDR and Democracy, as well as Take Hold of Our History, which people should take hold of. And uh, don't forget the British Marxist historians and the British Marxist historians. It's been too long. It's good to get the old show back and running again. It really is. I'll thank you. Thank you, Professor Harvey J.K. Follow him on Twitter at Harvey J.K. Take care, David. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. <laughs>